Hey guys, welcome back to the pre-production podcast. It is so nice to have you here again. I am sitting with two of my favorite working filmmakers and writers today. They are Scott Beck and Brian Woods. They have a new book out. It's called Haunt. It's the screenplay and filmmaker diaries. It's really informative. You should read it. They, of course, are the writers of A Quiet Place, the writers and directors of Haunt. The writers of the upcoming The Boogeyman, which comes out June 2nd, and the writer directors of easily like top five most anticipated movies of the year, 65, starring Adam Driver, which comes out March 10th. You guys are like, I guess, really busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I amidst that, I mean, Chris, thanks for having us on. Like we're we're such huge fans of yours. And so it's a pleasure to be able to connect on, on this podcast, which is such a great concept. We're so excited for this. Well, that's crazy for me to hear because I feel like you guys are making the most exciting genre stuff today. Quiet Place blew me away, blew a lot of people away. Haunt, I think, is really 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 good like incredibly good i've seen it many times you've shown your rejection letters on twitter and social media and you've talked often about how difficult it was to get to the point that you're at now it's a lot of many places but like if i trace it back to something that sticks in my head it was actually the making of movies that kind of coalesced at the same time that I was discovering movies. And, and part of that was growing up in this small town, Bent North, Iowa. I have a sister, Christina, who's three years older than me. And she had this sense of like, I want to use mom and dad's camcorder and be able to like write a script and make movies. And so I kind of, to a certain degree, credit her for leading leading the charge, like taking the mantle and starting to set up like these scripted movies. And, and her interest was much more like, you know, flowery, like Anne of Green Gables-esque movies. And so that's what I first like starred in and I'd hit the record button and we'd figure out not editing it, you know, non-linear, but like cutting and then setting up the next scene and, and, and picking out like wardrobes and such. And we lived in this, in this area where we didn't really have friends that could just come on over. So it literally was like, I would play all the different like guy roles. My sister would play all the different girl roles. And we kept doing that until like we started having different friends, either my sister's friends or my own friends. And we would start making action movies and comedies or something. It was just kind of a, an eye-opening thing as I was also discovering movies as a kid, like Terminator, Predator, and discovering, oh, there actually might be a way that you can make movies that look like the ones that are in the movie theater or on TV. And it was just really invigorating at that, that age. And unbeknownst to Scott, down the street from where he lived in the same town, I was doing the exact same thing. I was I had action figures that I would film with stop motion, and I'd be getting all of my friends in the neighborhood who had cool, like nicer cameras and and better equipment. And I was always trying to convince them to make a movie. I remember, you know, Halloween was always a great time of the year to make movies because my friends and I would all have really cool costumes. So <laughs> in second grade, it's like, all right, now we can make the Batman movie because because I was Batman for Halloween and my friend on the street was Penguin. And so we would dress up and, and make movies. And what was so great about finally meeting Scott when we met in about so like sixth grade, sixth grade yeah. when we finally met, it was like, oh, you, you like doing that too. Like I, I've been begging my friends who hate making movies to make movies and you've been bothering your poor family to help <laughs> make movies. How we can do it together. We both actually like enjoy and love it. You mentioned that Brian, that your friends hated making the movies. I had that really that hits home for me. <laughs> I think I forced, I forced a lot of people to be in front of the camera that did not want to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those it's... are some of the best performances. By <laughs> what were some of the schemes that you would do to try to get people to act in your stuff? Or was it just like, let's just fucking go. We're going to do this. I don't care what you think. It's funny. I feel like collectively there was always like pizza, like just hanging out and getting like pizza and Mountain Dew at that, at that point or surge because this would have been the 90s like that was kind of the, i miss surge or i i miss it dearly so i think it was that i think it was also like i know at times like we would have like sleepovers like when brian and i finally had met each other we would have sleepovers and it'd be like let's make a funny commercial parody or let's make a comedy movie 
And Brian and I would always be the ones like up still at 4 a.m. wanting to finish it while everyone else was like, I just want to play like Mortal Kombat or something. So it was always like pulling teeth, but there was a way that we started to discover, oh, maybe we should go out and start auditioning local actors because they actually have the the desire yeah, we, to we make would, movies. We would hold these auditions in our hometown and we'd be these like two like 14 year olds sitting behind <laughs> the table and like a 35 year old would walk in to read for us and be like, well, <laughs> <laughs> and it was very odd, but you know, we just, you know, pretended to be professionals and learned, learned how to make movies mm-hmm. just by doing it and just by loving it and, and, you know, performing every role, so to speak. Was there ever a period where the idea that films could be crafted and made mm-hmm. wasn't in your head, like that movies were just this magical thing and you didn't really understand that people came together to make them? To a certain degree, yeah. I remember for the longest time, like hearing the word director thrown around, but I'm like, what What do they direct exactly? Like it was so confusing and and same with producer, although sometimes I'm, I'm still confused. <laughs> exactly. Oh, of course. Yeah, I made a movie and I still don't know what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a weird, weird position. That means many things. But I remember one thing I was fascinated by was when I shot on VHS, I'm like, why doesn't this look like the movies in cinemas or on TV? And I had no idea. And it wasn't until like high school that while still shooting on like digital eight that I was like, oh, there's these plugins that you can use on, you know, rudimentary programs back then that start making things look more like cinema. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, that elevates a performance. I actually remember looking at uh, there was this movie that came out in like 2001 starring Robert De Niro called 15 Minutes. And on the behind the scenes, they showed part of the movie shot on handheld video tape because that was one of the gimmicks in the movie. And De Niro's performance was unlike anything I saw, not for the better. It just looks so bizarre. You're right. I actually have that burned in my memory because you showed me. I want to say Scott called me up. Yeah. He's like, you got to see this because there's no, it's raw video. It's like high eight, like handy cam, like soccer mom camera footage of Robert De Niro acting, but they didn't do any sound treatment to his voice. There's no music. It's just stripped raw. Yeah, it was an amazing moment where it's like, oh, wow, like cinema itself can enhance a performance. Like even when you're Robert De Niro, if you strip it all away, there can be an amateur quality to it without the right lighting, the right sound Mm -hmm. design, the right texture on the voice. And it's kind of empowering because then all of a sudden you realize, oh, what we're doing on an amateur level, you can trace the line from amateur to professional. When you see like when you strip everything away, it's not significantly different. And we certainly feel that way. Like even though, you know, with our with our movie 60, five like it's got a got a substantial budget behind it in a studio but it also doesn't feel so far removed from making these movies as kids back in bed north iowa i had a similar experience when i was shooting on mini dv tape and i didn't understand how they made nighttime look good in movies because right. I, would, yeah. I would go out with the camcorder and i would be like we're gonna do a nighttime scene it's gonna be great and then like we'd all stand there i'm like i can't see shit like, yeah. I can't see your expression. We're, we're all just blobs of noise. Having that experience of thinking, if I get a camcorder, I can make a movie that looks as good as Signs, and I'm going to make Signs, yeah. which I did. I did. I, I reshot Signs on camcorder. Oh, wow. Um, need to see this. Really? You really don't need to see it. <laughs> no, we really need yeah. to see this. Um, this is awesome. It was during the winter time. So, of course, we couldn't do a crop circle. So, like, my friends and I, who, of course, we were, like, 15 years old, we go outside and someone had made a crop circle, but it was all in with sticks. That's smart. That's good. That's <laughs> someone had, it was Blair Witch. Someone had set up a crop yeah. circle sticks. What does this mean? Must be aliens. So yeah, no, it was, <laughs> I, I had my whole, I had a friend painted green. It was wonderful. Oh, wow. Um, you went all out. <laughs> we had to, but yeah, no, I mean, this relates to kind of what you were saying is there was this weird period where you're sort of realizing that gear and equipment and lights and all of that plays a major role and it's not just about setting up a camera and having someone in front of it right. you you're adding a lot to that experience as a director you're making everyone look better as a result mm-hmm. too it's funny you mentioned the gear because there was a while like when we were high school maybe freshman year of college starting to like use any proceeds that we had from like prior movies that we like held premieres for take take like those donations from people that saw the movies and roll them into like better gear but what's funny is i also remember like my freshman year of college showing some of the um films in my film class just to show like what i was working on and they were like you're really good at using the technical stuff but you really need to work on your screenwriting skills 
And I was like, oh no, have we started like concentrating so much on trying to make things look good? And we've forgotten the fundamental thing of like the stories where it's like, ideally you're figuring those things out in parallel. And so that was kind of like a humbling moment where it's like, okay, we need to go back and like rethink about how important story and character really is. At what point did you really start to think about screenwriting in general? Because like for me, I, most of my shorts as a kid were either improv or I wrote them like it was a book, like it was prose. Mm. You know, I didn't mm. think about formatting. I didn't think about structure or anything like that. Where did that start to creep in for you guys? Pretty early. I mean, I know Scott and I were both writing like plays when we were in elementary school, but like not like, pl- like they were horrible. I, I don't mean like, it sounds like- we wrote a Broadway play when I was seven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we were writing, you know, terrible screenplays all through a middle school and high school. And, and so it's weird. The screenwriting was always something that was important to us. Like we were, we would submit to contests in high school, screenwriting contests. Never, we've never placed in a screenwriting contest, by the way, ever. And we would, you know, get online and research. We'd read other screenplays and we'd go to the bookstore and buy the Magnolia script and kind of let that be a guide to teach us how to how the formatting works and we, we would get very frustrated because the word processors didn't format like a screenplay so we bought this program on floppy disk called scriptware in the age of pirating we actually as teenagers threw down the 350 dollars mm. to buy the screenwriting <laughs> software and the company scriptware went out of business like a month after we bought the program and so it had this obnoxious passwords startup thing that you basically, every time you turn on the program, you couldn't start writing until it did this like two minute countdown because you needed to have the authorization code to to unlock the program. Even though we paid for it, we didn't have it because the company closed. So it became part of our ritual. But anyways, it's a long-winded way of saying screenwriting was always very important to us, but it wasn't something we were very good at, if that makes any Mm -hmm. sense. It, It took many, many years and many terrible scripts. And even to this day, I I think we have to like, we look at our work that's even been produced and always ask ourselves what could have been better and what should we have done differently? Because it's not, it's not something that we feel good at instinctually. It's something that Mm -hmm. we've learned over years, if that, if that makes any sense. No, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, like I said, I read your, your new book and I felt like I lived inside of your collective anxiety about, (laughs) you know, know, about making haunt and making sure and, and seeing quiet place released and those experiences. And so I think that level of concern about one's work is, is very healthy. I know that oftentimes people talk negatively about imposter syndrome, but I think it's good, though, because it kind of makes you be your own best critic and you're constantly second Mm -hmm. guessing yourself and you're not sort of drinking the Kool-Aid and letting other people tell you you're great because then you start just releasing like, oh, I'm great. I'm just going to start working on stuff because I'm great. But no, like you guys are really looking at this material in a critical way. Yeah, I mean, I totally relate to that. I mean, I I certainly have imposter syndrome. I don't think it'll ever go away. And I think there's a degree at which you can either let that run you down or you embrace it exactly like you're saying, Chris. Like, I think there's a use in it. There's a, there's a healthy way to kind of view that. And you realize, one, most people, if not everybody, has their own form of imposter syndrome. I have a friend who's incredibly successful, runs several businesses, and I asked him, like, what's your secret? Like, he's he's fairly young. And he said, jokingly, but somewhat serious, I always am like one Google search ahead of the rest of the team in terms of like figuring out how to like run this business, how to, how to expand and such. I think that's true. As long as you stay hungry and alert and you figure out what your ambitions are, your ambitions will take you to places that feel rather uncomfortable And honestly, that's, I think, especially in a creative field, that is the best place that you really want to live. You need a healthy dose of fear to motivate you. And and hopefully you you let it be a balance where you can overcome that fear and you don't let it kind of run your life, which which is always kind of the, the balance I'm always trying to figure out personally. You mentioned screenplay contests and how you'd never placed in any. So this is a topic of hot debate amongst spec writers and everyone who's trying to write. Do you feel that there is any, I won't say validity, but that there's, that they can help, that screenplay contests yeah. really are worth their salt? I think so. Like if you can place in Nickel, like if you can place in like a, a good screenwriting competition, like Nickel Fellowship or Austin Film Festival screenplay contest, that can be really great for your career. I think it's also a good, I guess it's just a good reminder, or maybe it's like a good training wheels for the business and that there's a, a bit of a lottery element to this business. You have to be able to generate a great script to get a movie made. 
But that's not enough. It's not enough to just have a great script. You also have to have other people recognize that. When we submitted, just to be clear, when we submitted screenplays to contests, they weren't good. And objectively, we can go back now. And be like, yeah, we did not deserve to win. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to make it sound like we should have, you know, we should have placed. They got it wrong. I think they got it right. But surely there are many talented writers out there who are submitting to screenplay contests and not winning and not placing. And they've got a great piece of material, but the person who's reading it just doesn't quite see the potential or something like that. So the, yeah, the business has this kind of weird lottery thing, but I think it's worth doing. It's also tricky. How do you break in as, as, a, as a writer? There's no clean cut clear path. So basically our advice would be to just do anything and everything that you can. So why not? One question that I've always kind of thought about in relation to that, and I've dealt with this myself. I have a very good writer friend who's dealt with this, but you mentioned that being a writer and trying to break in is difficult, especially if you're not repped, if you're, mm -hmm. you're not part of any guild, you're not part of the WGA yeah. And you're just kind of someone who might have some text that's good that could be bought. There's a lot of predatorial people out there who will try to scoop mm -hmm. up something and make it and they don't have respect for you. They're going to change it. They're going to ask you to do unpaid rewrites endlessly. This has happened to me and it's happened to my friend. And I'm curious if you guys have dealt with anything like that while you were trying to get started. Just the idea that like you have nothing, no one's on your side, but here's an opportunity. I'll literally do anything to make this movie. And suddenly you realize this just isn't really healthy or it's business wise right. not working out. I think there's, there's something about two of us that like, the two of us have a big bullshit filter, so to speak. And so like early on, I'm mean, like, I can think of it's, it's not a one for one example, but like there was this person that saw like some of our student films and they're like, Oh, I've got a bunch of video stores in Bermuda. And he was like, I will carry your movies in there. And it felt like a huge opportunity to us at the time. And so we started going down that conversation and then all of a sudden, like, Kind of the bullshit flags came up immediately and i feel like that was our first taste of like oh there's a lot of people that are out there that have predatory instincts so to speak or they're looking to make money in unscrupulous ways and i'm trying to think like in in the script stage i feel like we tried not engaging with too many producers early or trying to get our stuff out there in a huge way it was more about i think also because we're directors just going off and writing things that we could make, that we could control. One of our, our things that ended up like breaking us in was a short film that we made called Impulse. And that was after like years and years of just writing things on spec, but like not placing in competitions, writing tons of query letters, not ever getting anybody to like hook onto those. And so we just got so frustrated at a certain point that we went off and made this film back in Iowa. And we were able to show that at like a small film festival here in Los Angeles. And one of our friends had a bunch of development assistant friends that saw the movie. And through that pipeline, they were able to like expose the, the film to different managers and agents. And so we kind of like did a weird, you know, backwards way of trying to like break into the industry where we're just so frustrated that we're like, we're just going to go off and incubate our own thing. Yeah. And the business is inherently predatory because it's like you're describing kind of maybe more fringe sources of this poaching and, and taking advantage of people. But like at the studio level, like, I mean, every studio and every financier is ostensibly trying to buy something <laughs> that they want to control and they want to profit off of. And their interests and needs are almost always at odds with the artist that is participating with mm -hmm. them. And so it's it's just a, what a weird business that we've all decided to <laughs> make a living in and work in and be a part of we wouldn't do it if we didn't love it so much but it's very hard to wrap your head around even at this older age absolutely I, i've was talking with david f sandberg about some of his experiences making big studio movies and how afterwards he still just kind of wanted to go to his apartment and make a short film with his wife right uh, yeah. You know, because you just you can just go and decompress and have yes. complete control over something and just create something for fun after going through the studio grinder. So at some point you're making impulse, you're sort of frustrated by spec scripts not working out. You've clearly written a lot. You've submitted to many contests, rejected many times. How did impulse affect your career at that time? Were you able to get repped or how did it propel you forward? 
Yeah, with Impulse, we were able to screen it at a film festival. And and through that situation, we kind of had a series of assistants basically vouching for our work and trying to send it to the managers that they worked for. And so our manager, who we've been with ever since then, how many years? Yeah, that's been? like 13 years this fall. 13 actually. years yeah. of Brian Cunningham, who's now at Anonymous Content. He started at Madhouse, saw our film and read a script of ours that is still unproduced, but we hope to maybe make someday. With that, he was it was just enough to get him intrigued enough to, to represent us. And that's where the work begins on some level, mm-hmm. because the, the dream is, oh my gosh, I got signed by a manager. Like my career's now I have to sit back and wait for them to bring me some projects and bring me some money, bring me a you know a sack yeah. full of cash. But the reality is this is where you start working and you start writing and, and generating material so that they can take it out to the marketplace. And the marketplace doesn't want anything to do with you because you're a nobody who just directed a short film. But now we've read your script and now we think, okay, you guys are kind of interesting and maybe you could do something. And, and it, you take meetings based on that. And the more meetings you take and the more material you generate, the more opportunities you get. Yeah. So I remember like that first year after signing with Ryan at Madhouse, he would set us up like on meetings. Like we would, we had a meeting at like Ridley Scott's office and granted, it's not like you're meeting Ridley Scott or even anyone like high up in the company, but you're meeting like a creative executive or something. And all those meetings, like they don't always lead directly to work, but they're, they're all relationships. And sometimes you find people that you just genuinely like really get along with. And the longer you stay in the business, the more you start seeing those people like turn into VPs and sometimes presidents of of production companies, studios, even those relationships often kind of circle back on each other in, in some fortuitous way. The first general meeting we ever took was with an executive named Alana Mayo. And she coincidentally or not many years later was the first executive at Paramount to read A Quiet Place. And she wow. brought the project and vouched for it. And then another early relationship we had in our careers was with this producer, Brittany Morrissey, who used to work at Davis Entertainment. Now she's our executive on 65 at Sony. So you just, you know, some of these relationships, you meet a lot of people, but sometimes you form a connection with somebody and you kind of move up through the ranks together. I've only had a manager for like two years now, but I've experienced the same things. The very first general meeting I had is with someone who's currently trying to develop something with me. And it was just Hmm. a strange situation where you make a good impression on someone they make a good impression on you they remember you they hear your name a year from now and think oh this person might be great for our whatever movie we want to do and and it just keeps rolling until something happens finally (laughs) but uh, exactly yeah Yeah. speaking of something finally happening i think that that for me has been the most difficult thing is waiting and and just the, Mm -hmm. the the pure existential dread that comes with waiting forever. And I'm curious how you guys deal with that, waiting for that email, waiting for that call, whatever it is, an actor to say yes, a studio to green light something, you know, just the, the endless yeah. period of waiting. Is there anything you guys <laughs> yeah, can... We're, anxiety just to hear We're constantly, in a, yeah, there's something we're, we're, we're dealing with right now where there's that same waiting. So it doesn't, it doesn't go away. The hope is that the coping mechanisms get better. I mean, I remember very viscerally like laying in bed many nights before we were able to make our first feature film. And I just was like, when are we going to be able to make our first feature? And you do have that existential dread. And the answer that I needed to hear was don't wait. You can have lots of responses to that. Like if you're a writer, you can go write something. If you're a filmmaker, you can shoot anything, like just scratch that itch. And the one thing that I think the lesson that we are remembering and trying to teach ourselves every time is to make your own opportunities. That's something that we did as kids, you know, getting our friends together and just make movies and not wait for the right time. We're constantly doing that in the scripts that we write. And in order to protect ourselves, meaning ensure that one way or the other, we'll get this made. We like to write things on a scalable level. So like an example is like a quiet place. Like we wrote that. So that could be produced for, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. And we'd have all the resources we needed back in our home state of Iowa to really make that movie for that budget. It just so happened it became a studio film and, and was produced for, for millions. But every time we're writing something, we're trying to envision like, What's the lowest budget version of this so we can go off and and make our own destiny? And it's something you're so clearly doing, Chris, you know, writing your material and taking your career into your own hands and making a movie, you know, no one's going to stop you from doing it. And it's it's really 
inspiring for us to even watch the process that you've been going through because it's, it's a reminder to us that you that you just have to you get, you've got to go generate and you got to create your own opportunities mm -hmm. and, and make it happen thank you yeah no i mean i obviously completely agree with what you guys are saying and and following your careers and reading your book and everything i, I do feel like we've taken similar approaches to attempting to smash through the wall you know no one's yeah. really opened a door you just kind of there with like a pickaxe just like i will get in yeah <laughs> it's yeah. gonna happen i don't care what you say yeah yeah i mean making stuff that you can actually afford or that that is feasible really did help me a lot when i would pitch and i would say look i really do think you can make this for like you know two hundred thousand dollars or something i really yeah. do think there is a version of this a script that i always think about that could easily be both movies the expensive and cheap is panic room because yes. yeah. uh -huh. panic room could be like you know two people in a room and there's people and there's there's cameras there's tvs that show that that people are breaking in there's like a hundred thousand dollar fifty thousand dollar version of that movie but then yeah. also there's the david fincher version which of course i prefer yeah. but yeah yeah <laughs> that to me is the true secret recipe is can yeah. you write a script that could be both and, and quiet place is perfect for mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. it can be, it can be the big studio movie, but it can also be what you guys originally envisioned. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons we've always had such a, I guess like it's a filmmaker like M. Night Shyamalan has always been really inspiring to us because he always has these like big high concept ideas, but they're very contained and, and they're kind of an artful telling of a, of a big idea. And we've also always identified with older filmmakers, like classic filmmakers, like Alfred Hitchcock is, is inspiring, not just because the work is incredible, but because Hitchcock was working at a time when visual, you know, there were no CGI compute, you know, like the, the, the effects were very rudimentary. The cameras and lenses were what they were. And, and you only had so many tools in your toolbox as a filmmaker. And so watching older films is inspiring to a young filmmaker that doesn't have a lot of resources because you can kind of go like, Oh, what was, what was Hitchcock able to achieve without a fancy techno crane and just yeah. kind of a dolly and, and a good idea, you know, the power of imagination. Reading your book, one of my favorite things was after each diary entry that'd be recently watched. And you guys would list oh, what right. movies you had seen mm -hmm. recently. And I, I'll tell you, I actually started doing that in my own journal because of oh, awesome. because oh, cool. of you guys. And I added I added an, an extra thing to it. I said recently watched with kids. So like I have oh, a yeah. thing. That's a I have a thing of movies I saw by myself, and then movies and TV I watched with the kids. Um, That's a good idea. I need to do that too. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's a it's a nice memory. Like oh yeah, I remember just like yeah. them sitting there watching Card Captor Sakura for two hours. One of the things I noticed you mentioned Shyamalan was was throughout Haunt. You guys both like on repeat watched The Village quite often. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm curious, you know, I did this while I was in prep for Shelby Oaks. And during one long weekend, we had a long weekend because of a holiday in the middle of, of shooting. I rewatched Signs halfway through because that was the movie that made me want to make films. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I saw Independence Day as a kid and I thought, wow, that was really fun. But I had no idea how anyone would make Independence Day. Yeah, like I, it just right. there was nothing in my head that went, oh, yeah, I know how they fucking yeah. Yeah, yeah i know how they did that no i had no fucking clue but then i saw signs yeah. which is also an alien invasion movie but i left going i think i understand how they made that movie i, I actually right. think i i think i get that like yeah. that makes sense to me and so he kind of did open up that part of my brain like as a kid and i, I know he helped you guys a lot too in that too yeah i mean you know talking about something like the village i mean that felt like it was a slice of life out of something that could have happened in iowa where we grew up and i think that was massively inspiring because you you watch that film and you realize, oh, like the scares are really suggestive. Like you don't have to like flash something expensive in terms of visual effects on screen constantly. And the sound design was so masterfully done. And that got our, our interest in sound design like really early because we realized what a great special effect that is. And then it comes down to the writing. It's like creating really provoking characters that are on a journey that blends both genre, but emotion. And then we were like, all we have to do is like work on our writing, work on our writing. And then everything else, the technical aspects can be the icing on the cake. There's also with something like The Village, like there's a rebelliousness in us where you, you tend to, the movies you really love sometimes are the movies that didn't get a fair shake when they came out, right? Like The Village yeah. got brutalized by critics and you can understand the machination of how that happened and the expectation level versus the movie and what did people want out of the movie versus what they got. And you can understand how it happens. But Truffaut talks about how 
sometimes there's these like imperfect movies that filmmakers make that you end up loving more than maybe other films that are considered classics just because of the way that they came out and were maybe misunderstood. I have the exact same feeling about certain movies. I mean, I I went back and I I reread reviews for Unbreakable when it first came out and Mm. virtually all of them were like the twist was not as as amazing as the six sense. (laughs) And it's like, okay, so I, I see where your head was at when you went in. And you yeah. really, you really let was, that affect you. The twist was only the second greatest twist in the cinema in cinema history. <laughs> yeah. That's the number one greatest twist. Yeah. And you look at that movie now, and what does everyone say? Oh, it was ahead of its time. You know, it was a comic book yeah. movie before the comic book boom, and it's about superheroes and blah blah blah. And it was a serious telling of superhero lore, and it was so great. But back then, you look at it, and it's got like a sixty something and whatever, and people are like, "That's not as impressive as whatever." To my right is an original theatrical print of a movie called Stay that oh, yes. was directed by Mark Forster. Oh, yeah, Forster. yeah. We've been um, talking about, hold on, this movie keeps has come up like four we, times in the yeah, last we week. Just, it's getting uh, weird. Yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, it's fate. It's destiny. It all led you here. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not the greatest place. It'll be a good podcast at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking at it and it's got, you know, Ewan McGregor, Ryan Gosling and Naomi Watts. And I fucking love that movie. Yeah. yeah. And it's by no means, you know, Mark Finding Neverland's probably a better film for Mark Forrester, you know, and, but whatever. When I went to the Critics' Choice Awards is the only time I ever went. Ewan McGregor was there and I was like, shit, I have to go up to him. I have to. And I did. And it was weird, you know, whatever. And I was like, dude, I, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi, shit, you know, whatever. And he was like, thank you. And then he said, what's your name? And I said, Chris Duckman. And he's like, did you make a documentary about Stay? And I went, well, I mean, I made a video about Stay. (laughs) And he was like, it's like 30 minutes long. I was like, yes, 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 I did. And he said, yeah, Mark Forster sent that to me. And he said, this is the only person who's ever understood my movie. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah, it was like, so I completely agree with you. And that sometimes you see a movie that by no means like I don't th- I don't consider science some masterpiece. I think it's a masterpiece. But if yeah. I wanted to be film critic, whatever, I wouldn't call it that. But stay mm-hmm. and movies like that have made more of an impact on me. I like collateral more than heat, you know, whatever. Like yeah. it happens. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. And I think that's great. That's amazing. Yeah. we Scott and I actually saw stay at the University of Iowa as young filmmakers, not knowing what to do and how to break into the business. And we sheepishly cornered Mark Forster and asked if he would read our screenplay, like a couple of <laughs> answers. And we actually had and he a was, hard copy printed out. Yeah. And we we went out to our car and then forced our friend to run back in and give him the hard copy of the script because we were too embarrassed. Yeah, we were like, too humiliated. And, and Mr. Forrester, he said he couldn't take the script because it was unsolicited, yeah. which is a very smooth move on his part. <laughs> but he was kind enough to ask to read the script. I, he actually, he wrote his manager's email address on yeah. there. So somewhere in my house in Bednor, if I still have like Mark, not Mark <laughs> Forrester's autograph, but his writing of his, his manager's email address. there. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's so cool. So at this point, obviously, you guys have clearly just been boots on the ground trying to get stuff done. You never really stopped. You're writing constantly. Like you said, you're querying people, you're, you're submitting to contests, you're making shorts, you're you're not giving up. It's what has to happen. You just don't stop. You're always working. So at what point did Nightlight come into your lives? So right when we signed with our manager, so this would have been like October 2010, our first meeting, our manager was like, okay, I've read this script sample that you have. I don't necessarily think that's the easiest thing to get made. It was kind of like Coen Brothers in tone, but we're not the Coen Brothers. So at the time, like found footage was very, very popular in terms of like a subgenre in horror. And we had this idea of this movie called Nightlight, which ostensibly is five friends going to a forest to play a game called Nightlight, where everybody has a flashlight. And it's kind of like flashlight tag in the woods. And our visual spin on it is it takes place from the point of view of the flashlight, which we discover is kind of haunted. So it motivates the point of view in a really weird supernatural way. And the hope from our point of view was to attempt, perhaps foolishly, attempt to elevate the visual (laughs) nature of found footage. We were like, all right, found footage is these like the ugliest, you know, cinematic style possible, right? Grainy video handheld. So we're like, what if 
what if Stanley Kubrick made a found footage movie? What would that look like? How do you make it cinematic and you do it all in wonders and beautiful? So we had this like really foolish notion, but it, it felt good on the page. And the mm-hmm. script was a popular script in the business. It got passed around very mm-hmm. quickly. And we found ourselves with a couple offers to go produce it for, I think it was, we had too much money to make it, to be honest. If we had less, it would have benefited yeah. the movie because we would have had less interference and supervision. But it, we, we had like a- I think a million, yeah, yeah. 1.5 when all is said and less, done. Yeah. So we developed that that idea with our, with our manager over the course of like 2011. And then like Brian said, like I think January of 2012, we took it out to a few production places. It was the usual suspects of like the Blumhouses. And one odd name on it that we were huge fans of was Groundswell Productions, producer Michael London, who did- Sideways and House of Sand and Fog and these incredible character dramas. And I remember seeing his name on the list and we're like, we love this this guy and his film. So why are we going out to him? And we sat down in a meeting and he he just loved the idea of like doing something character centric with the genre bend to it. And he made it happen. He was able to like, you know, have the funds ready for us to go off and make that movie. And like literally five months after having that meeting, we were we were on set wow. shooting light in, in Utah out, out in the woods. Holy shit. That's fast. Yeah. It came together really fast. We had a, we had a producer, Darren Brandel, who was like our age. He, we kind of, we met him when we were like 20 years old through like a filmmaking forum online and stuck with him. And he was the one to like put together a rough budget, like the schedule and all those things were kind of in hand when we took these production meetings so that it showed like a path forward of how to, how to get the movie up on its feet. So we really credit Darren for, for making it happen for us. Cause I think otherwise it would have taken a lot longer. I've seen Nightlight, and first off, I want to say there's an incredible scare at 25 minutes in with a dog. I think it's great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Was this an easy shoot? I don't want to like put words in your mouth, but the mm-hmm. way Brian you described the concept sure. seems like you think perhaps it was difficult to pull off in the way you envisioned. Yeah, it was difficult, and we realized pretty early on in pre-production that it was going to be a nightmare. There's like a there's like behind the scenes video of me somewhere in like a pizza joint at midnight in Utah being like, this is harder than apocalypse now. Like I'm like having a meltdown, which sounds <laughs> To be fair, like Brian and myself and Darren were making fun of him the whole they time from that. Me, but I was dead serious. Yeah. And the reason why is because it was so hard to have this POV driven movie where our main protagonist, Robin, is off camera the whole movie. She's holding the flashlight. She's holding the camera. The camera's never on her face. And so to get an audience to identify with her as a protagonist and and get immersed in the movie was very challenging. And then on top of that, as longtime fans of Children of Men, we were pressuring ourselves to do the whole movie in a series of oneers. And so the original edit of Nightlight is like, has less cuts in it than Unbreakable. It's like, because the movie didn't really work. As the one or experience, we ended up ha- kind of having to go through it and chop it up. And then it, it, at the end of the day, it kind of resembles more of like a paranormal activity yeah. edit style. It's but. a it's a weird movie for us to reflect on because we are fiercely proud of like all the actors, all the special effects, production designer, cinematographer, everybody that came together to make that movie. But I think we're self-conscious because we feel like our ambitions outweighed our talent and in making that movie. It was something that I think we had a very strict vision for, but possibly we put too many restrictions on what we were trying to make. And it made the film less organic in terms of, like Brian said, like our main character being behind the camera for 90% of the film, you don't get that automatic relationship with that character to, to necessarily like really care about them or, or follow their arc. And so there were a lot of a lot of lessons that I think we definitely learned on that film of what worked and what what not to do next time. Well, you know, for me, looking from the outside perspective on the film, I have the benefit of seeing everything you did after that as well. And it's it's incredibly obvious that the people who made Nightlight made Haunt and Quiet Place and because there's there's so much more ambition to it than the log line would suggest. Like if you read the log line for Nightlight and you, you the Nightlight game and there's friends in the woods, of you guys are clearly like really trying to make like a film. This isn't just like, oh, yeah, we can do it. It'll be fine. We'll do it in the woods. Without a doubt, you guys put a lot of effort into that movie. And it's very clear. You can see that the filmmakers who made that movie will have a future, you know, if they're given the right opportunity. 
That's very sweet of you to say. I think like we're just trying, we love a good big swing. I don't know that Nightlight's a big swing per se, but it was a little outside the box conceptually and and it was something we were trying. And I think when you try stuff, sometimes you face plant, sometimes you succeed, but we always admire the filmmakers that are trying to do something a, a little different and a, and a little outside the box. And, and thank you for Noticing, yeah, because like that's nice of you to say. We have no, again, as Scott said, we have zero <laughs> perspective on this experience other than it was a challenging film. And it also was a time in our life where when Nightlight got made, all of our dreams came true, right? Like that was like, oh my gosh, we're professional screenwriters and directors. Our dreams came true, but it didn't make us happier. It was a very stressful shoot and we worked our asses off for two and a half years straight. And then the movie came out and it has like a 12% on Rotten Tomatoes. And everyone basically said, you suck. And our career kind of like more or less died after that. And we had to resurrect it sort of not starting from scratch, but like it did feel like starting over a little bit. It's tricky, but coming out on the other side of it and looking back, I think it's very clear to us that we love movie making so much that it outweighs any of the the trauma and the right. drama of, of the making of the thing. Yeah, there was a poignant moment. It was pretty much the, the last moment in the nightlight journey because we shot that film in like 2012 and then it didn't come out to like 2015. And we had such a limited release that it was only in like a few theaters across the nation. We were out in LA and there was one at AMC Century City Walk and it played for only a week. And so myself, Brian and our producer, Darren, all decided to go see the very last screening that AMC was holding there. It was like a nine o'clock screening on like a Thursday night. And we knew we would only, we'd be the only people in the audience. We were like convinced no one else would be in that audience. And we walk up to the ticket counter, we're like three tickets for the nine o'clock screening of Nightlight. And the ticket clerk looked at us kind of confused and they kind of like looked back at the, the marquee and they're like, Oh, sorry. We actually canceled that screening because nobody bought tickets and the Fast and Furious sequel is uh, coming out tonight. So we booked that into that actor theater. So like that cathartic moment that we thought would be the final like nail in the coffin of Nightlight, we didn't even get to celebrate. But then it gave us almost immediate perspective of the idea that you're not here just for the end goal. You're not here for the end goal of like getting your movie released. Even in best case scenario, if a movie comes out, it makes tons of money or you get awards for it that's not ever delivering the satisfaction that you have to understand you can have by doing a good day's work or like writing five pages when you only thought I'd sit down at, at the laptop and write two pages. Like those are the successes that we try to take to heart as much as possible now in the wake of that, rather than kind of waiting for like the doors to open, because I think the failure is always something that is, is richer and best when shared and you can commiserate on it. But really, if you boil it down, it's like we do this because we love movies. We love making movies. And it's not just about the release of them or trying to chase the elusive success of them either. I just really can't tell you how much you guys have inspired me over the years, reading all your posts and following you guys and, of course, your films. It really means a lot that there's people like you making movies out there. Oh, well, thank you. And I mean, likewise, you know, the fact that you're just going out and making, you know, your own fate in your own hands, like that's that inspires us right back. And, and um, all of your your love and enthusiasm for the medium that you've been sharing all over the years with your movie reviews is something that I know as filmmakers, we get excited about watching and so many, I mean, you're inspiring so many other people. So right back at you. Thanks for the sweet words, though. It's so, so nice. Thank you. And I have one last funny thing about your book that I noticed. And I have to I have to know if this is if this was intentional. I don't know if anyone's mentioned this to you yet. OK, <laughs> but uh -oh. you, you have a diary entry Sunday, September 22nd, 2019. It is from Woods, Brian Woods. And you said, <laughs> been following all the haunt reactions on Twitter, Instagram, etc., it's been really gratifying to see how much fun people are having with the film. It belongs to the audience now, so it's time to turn our attention to the next project. Do you know that that is on the bottom of page 65? <laughs> <laughs> uh, normally, you know, that's I'm funny. actually embarrassed. That's amazing. Oh, wow. Because that's the kind of thing that uh, sadly we would we would pay attention to. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. But this is news to yeah. me, actually. We did not, we did not plan it because... 
yeah, I think the, we were flopping margins and stuff. So that would be a review. Yeah. You've brought that to our attention. We never, and it's funny because all throughout the process of like writing 65, we wrote 65 on spec. So there was no guarantee of getting that movie, like even sold, let alone made. And that we would, we would joke to each other and always text like, oh, I saw the like 65 on a parking stall or something where I accidentally parked, like all those little signs. So we're not usually like superstitious, but not at all, but 65 but, has made yeah. us like all of a sudden we're into numerology. And it's yeah, just- <laughs> I just thought that was so far. I was reading it. I was sitting down reading it and then it was the next thing that came to my eyeball right after our next project. I was like, that's impossible. It's impossible. Because I've read your guys' scripts, you know, like they sent me like an awards version of A Quiet Place. I read it, you know, oh, yeah. and I think I tracked down your original version of it yeah, too. That I read. Draft, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, a, a Haunt. And you guys are great with format. It's, it's one of the reasons I love reading your scripts is you guys play around with it so much and it's like it's exciting to read oh thanks so, yeah, yeah i think we're just self-conscious because we're bad readers and so like reading a script sometimes is like homework and so we're like oh what makes it like more fun or more cinematic and so i think we're just self-conscious that everybody might be just like us <laughs> we're always trying to make our scripts digestible so. first page really has to hit it's got to hit you yeah. gotta want to keep going well look yeah, guys Honestly, again, this was great. Please, for the listeners out there, check out their Haunt book. You can get it on Amazon and many other places. If you haven't seen Quiet Place or Haunt, what the fuck, man, just go watch it. And of course, Boogeyman comes out June 2nd and your film 65 on March 10th. Thank you guys so much for being here. Oh, thanks so much, Chris. It's Thank been you, great. Chris.